So now our first speaker is Earl K. Stice with the topic, The Meaning of Numbers in Our Life. Please welcome. So if we're going to change the world, and we're going to change ourselves, and we're going to talk about our minds, we need to talk about numbers. Numbers are what influence us, what uh, control our behavior, what make us think certain things. Numbers, most important thing there is. So if we're going to start changing the world, let's start with numbers. You like numbers. I can tell just by looking at you. So let's talk about numbers. Think about a day in your life. So think about yourself this morning. Yourself this morning. You're lying in bed. You wake up. Should you get up or should you just stay there in bed? What tells you whether you should get up or not? A number. You're going to look at the clock by your bed or your phone or your watch. And depending on that number, maybe you're late. The number will tell you. Maybe it's time to get up right now or maybe you can spend a few more minutes in bed. How do you know? You look at the number. The very first thing you see in the morning is a number, what time it is, and that gets you up. Now, if you're a curious person, you're probably going to be on the internet pretty soon after you get up. And if you're interested in the economy of Kazakhstan, you're going to go online and you're going to look at two numbers. You're going to look at the price of oil, and you're going to look at the Kazakhstan tenge exchange rate. This morning, by the way, if you didn't look, the price of oil is $37 a barrel for Brent crude oil. The exchange rate between the tenge and the US dollar, 343. Those two numbers, 37 and 343, tell us about millions of economic interactions that took place during the night while you were asleep, just reflected in those two numbers. All right, now it's time to leave your house. When I leave my apartment building, I go out on the street, sometimes I, I uh, take the bus to come here to the university. But how do I know which bus to get on? There are lots of buses going back and forth. I just look at the number. If the bus says 40 on the front, I get on that bus and I come here to campus. The number tells me. Now I get here to campus. Let's say I had a, a very difficult exam last week. I understood some of the material, but some of the material I'm afraid I didn't master. How well did I do? How well did I understand that material? Well, I get my exam paper back today and it says 82. That one number summarizes my understanding of that material. And also we see that numbers are often involved with controversy. Was it a fair exam? Does that 82 really reflect how well I did on the exam? What was the process used in generating that 82? Numbers are often in the middle of controversy. Now, many of my friends have had influenza recently. Am I also sick? How can I tell? Well, what is a very quick way to tell if I'm sick or not? A number. I measure my body temperature. And if it says 37, I'm OK. Don't worry. But if I measure my body temperature and it says 40, I'm sick. I need to go to the doctor. And now it's nighttime. You go home. You've worked hard all day. You're feeling a little tired. Should you lie down and go to sleep? How do you know? You look at the number. You woke up with a number. You go to sleep with a number. And numbers have been influencing your behavior all day long. Our bodies, our minds are controlled to some degree by the numbers that we see every day. Numbers are how we change the world. Now, uh, there's a Nobel Prize winning economist named Herbert Simon, and he said this, and I'm going to read this, bounded rationality. The term bounded rationality is used to designate rational choice that takes into account the cognitive limitations of both knowledge and cognitive capacity. In other words, our brains are not big enough to have all the data of everything in the world right in our brains. And even if the data were in there, we wouldn't have the capacity to process them. So we need to simplify our world. We use numbers to simplify our world. This next person is not a Nobel Prize winning economist. It's me. But I also uh, have some thoughts on this. The objective of the fields of statistics and accounting is to refl reflect the essence of a complex situation in one number. And it helps us navigate our way in this complex world. Now, this goes a little uh, stronger. Perception influences action. Accounting and numbers determine perception. Therefore, accounting rules the world. You've often wondered in life, but who's running things around here? What is, is ruling the world? It's accounting and numbers rule the world. Now you know. It's not President Putin. It's not even President Nazarbayev. It's numbers and accounting that rule the world. So here's my agenda. I'm going to tell you how numbers can be very influential in our society, in business, uh, which is my specialty, and also in our personal lives. So let's get started. How old? is this use of numbers in making decisions. How old is accounting? Well, it's really old. It's over 7,000 years old. In fact, numbers are older than writing. Accounting is older than writing. Think of those first farmers in Mesopotamia 7,000 years ago. Had some sheep. Do I have more sheep this year than I had last year? Well, I don't know. I can count them, 
But I can't remember how many I had last year, so I don't know. But somebody had the great idea, I'm going to count my sheep, 42, and I'm going to mark it down on the wall. And next year, one year from now, when it's the same season, I'll count my sheep again. And there are 45. And I look on the wall and I say, that's more than I had last year. My number of sheep went up. And the word's going to go around the village. His number of sheep went up. What did he do? What's his secret? All of a sudden, we start to be able to use numbers to change the way we behave in society because we write them down. The first writing was accounting and numbers. So all the books that you read, realize that numbers and accounting came before those books. It's the foundation of our civilization. Numbers, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, this summer, the world's going to go to Rio de Janeiro for the Summer Olympics. And one of the premier events in the Summer Olympics is the 100-meter dash, the women and the men. The current world's record for women in the 100-meter dash is 10.49 seconds. For men, it's 9.58 seconds, Usain Bolt. We're going to see if he can win for the third time in a row this, this summer. 95 years ago, the record for the 100-meter dash for women was 13.6 seconds, and for men, it was 10.4 seconds. The gap is what I want you to think about between women and men was 3.2 seconds 95 years ago. Now it's less than one second. Well, what's happened? Why are women catching up? Why are women catching up so fast? Is it evolution? Are women's bodies evolving much faster than men's? No, there's no uh, biological evolution that explains that. It's the evolution of our society. Women no longer have to deal with the barriers that they had to deal with 95 years ago. 95 years ago, women had a mental barrier. Uh, should I run? Should I train? I don't think I can do it. Society would tell women that they couldn't do it, but those barriers have been broken down in the last 95 years. Women have been catching up with men here and in many other ways, and that big change in our society is summarized in four numbers. Numbers tell us a lot about a lot of things. Now let's imagine that there's a young woman named Lily. We'll talk about business now. She wants to start, her dream is to have an ice cream factory. In fact, she's decided she wants to build it in this very room. She's going to make beautiful chocolate vanilla ice cream and other terrible flavors. Chocolate and vanilla are the best. So she's going to make an ice cream factory right here. What's standing between her dream of a chocolate or of an ice cream factory and the actual factory itself? It's just 100 million US dollars to buy the property and to put the machines in. 100 million US dollars. Where's she going to get that 100 million US dollars? Think about it was you. Where would you get 100 million US dollars? Well, maybe your personal savings, but most of us would come up a little short uh, of the $100 million. Our friends and family, our neighbors, but that's still not going to be enough. We're going to have to get the money from strangers, from big groups of banks, from private investors. Maybe we'll have to take our company public and sell shares of our company to people who live in Zimbabwe and Finland and in Australia, strange places that we'll never see. How? How can we convince strangers to give us $100 million to turn our dream of an ice cream factory into reality? It's numbers. Numbers are going to do that. Without reliable financial reports, the dreams of people who want to start companies, entrepreneurs we call them, can never become reality. Those numbers, those accounting reports, are what convert dreams into reality. Very, very influential. It's what makes our economy happen. OK. I just while I'm here talking about business, here are two numbers. Tax rates for two companies of which you've heard, I'm sure, Microsoft and ExxonMobil. Microsoft's tax rate is 19.2%. ExxonMobil's tax rate, 38.4%. Uh, Quite a bit different, but they're both based in the United States, and I happen to know that the national tax rate for corporations in the United States is 35%. So how is Microsoft paying such a low tax rate? Now, if this were an accounting class, I'd now have you break up into groups, and we generate ideas about why this is. I'm just going to tell you, Microsoft is run by smart people. And they say in their financial reports that their uh, operations are located in Singapore and Puerto Rico and Ireland. Now, why would they choose Singapore and Puerto Rico and Ireland? Because the tax rates are low there. And if they can generate most of their income in those low tax places, they pay an on average lower tax rate. Why doesn't ExxonMobil do the same thing? Because their operations are determined by where the oil is. And in just these two numbers, we see something important about our modern economy. Intellectual property can be moved around. Microsoft's operations are based on intellectual property. And that intellectual property is going to find where low tax rates are. 
The old-fashioned businesses like ExxonMobil are stuck where they are, and so they have to pay the high tax rates. And governments are frustrated with this around the world because the Microsofts and the Apples and the Googles can move their valuable economic assets, intellectual property around, to pay lower tax rates. And that very interesting economic development is summarized in two numbers. Numbers tell us so much about the world that we live in. Now, we can also use numbers to get people to do what we want them to do. I'm a father. I'm often trying to get people to do what I want them to do. So I'll tell you. See, the microphone went out for a second when I said two sons, because <laughs> it's a lot of trouble, two sons. Five daughters, uh, that's a very good number. But let me tell you about my two sons. In 1995, uh, my family moved to Hong Kong. My sons were in middle school. I went with them to the first day of their school, and the principal of the school was telling about the great academic programs that the school had. It was very, very interesting until she happened to mention, if your children want to ride the, the private school bus to school, it will cost them seven US dollars a day each. She continued then talking about the academic programs of the school, but I didn't pay any attention to that, because now I'm thinking about that number, seven. Seven for him and seven for him. I knew that they could ride to school for one US dollar a piece with public transportation. We'd just done it to get to the school. So our family could save six US dollars a day each if, if I could just somehow convince them to take public transportation rather than this school bus. So I'm, thinking, I'm not listening to the principal anymore. But, she, but I came up with a plan. After she was done with their discussion, I said to my sons, come with me, I need to talk to you about something. We went out in the field behind their school. I explained these numbers to them and explained that our family could save $6 a day if they would only take public transportation. They weren't really that interested. Until I said this, I'll split the savings with you. If you'll take the public transportation, I will, here's the number that I put in their minds, $3 a day. I will pay you $3 a day to ride public transportation. Now, do you think that I ever had to talk to my sons again about taking public transportation to school? No, never a word. Every Friday, they would come to me and they just hold out their hands. 15 US dollars to son number one, 15 US dollars to son number, son number two. That measurement of three, that's what I would pay them each day if they would take public transportation. That solved our problem. I could have, I could have told them every day about the savings for our family and the good of our family. It'll be great for our family if they take public transportation. Not interested. But that number, three, that changed their attitude perfectly. We only had one problem with this. In the fall of their first year, they had a holiday. They didn't go to school on Monday and Tuesday. They only went Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So they came to me on Friday. They held out their hand. I only gave them $9 each. They said, Dad, it's $15. I said, mm, there's a holiday. You only, get, you, only get, you only went to school three days. After that, they bitterly complained every time there was a school holiday. They, they hated the Christmas holiday season. It cost them money. Uh, do you think they were ever sick and stayed home from school? They had to have bubonic plague before they would stay home from school because of the simple number, three. I pay them $3 a day. It changed their behavior. So remember, you get what you measure. If I, want, if I want them to take public transportation, I have to measure it correctly. That number weighs heavily in their minds. I use it on myself. There are certain things that I want to do each day. So I have a little card. In accounting, we call this a balanced scorecard. I, I write down nine numbers every day. I'm not going to tell you all of them, because some of them are kind of personal. But I'll tell you about three of them. First, I weigh myself every morning, and I write it down. I write it down right here. I'm not going to tell you how much I weigh, but I know how much I weigh, because I write it down every morning. And it changes my behavior all day. I'll see some donuts sitting there. Oh, should I eat those donuts? If I eat that donut, it's going to pay me back tomorrow morning when I step on that scale. It controls my behavior or influences my behavior all day. Just that number, just the fact that I weigh myself each day. A couple of things that I measure each day are just zero or one. Did I exercise or not? Zero or one. Did I read with my daughters? I have two daughters who are 14 years old. And I long ago decided it's important that I read with them every day. So every day, if I read with them, I put down a one. If I don't read with them, I put down the zero. The things that are important in my life, I measure with numbers. And it's summarized on this little card, my balanced scorecard. Numbers can influence and guide and control our lives. They influence and guide and control our society, business, but also in our personal life. It's a very powerful tool, a number. I use numbers to help me do the things that I want to do. It makes my life better. And numbers can make your lives better as well.
Thank you very much.